Aloha! This is chapter 24.5, China and the New Imperialism. The Opium Wars, 19th century, which would be the 1800s, were a critical point in time for the for Chinese history. The first Opium War was fought between China and Great Britain from 1839 to 1842, and the second Opium War was from 1856 to 1860. Both of these wars greatly weakened China, made it vulnerable to internal unrest, and eventual, I guess you could say, predatory tactics by Europe European countries so that they could have more and more concessions from China. Japan is going to look on at this and going to be totally freaked out and they are going to go through their own internal restructuring which they call the Meiji Restoration where they become an industrialized country but with a lot of self-sacrifice. They go through a lot of suffering as a result of the Meiji Restoration. China in regards to the Opium Wars uh, because they lose both of these wars they end up having to secede the territory of Hong Kong and and they have to open ports to trade from foreigners or with foreigners. And they have to grant the foreigners special rights called extraterritoriality rights, where those foreigners are basically only accountable for laws that they will have in their own country. They're not accountable to the laws that are, are Chinese laws. The Chinese government had to allow Br the British to continue selling opium to the Chinese people. They also had to allow the British to have free trade rights throughout the entire area of China. So what can we learn from this kind of a system? Well, first of all, wars were really fought over the issue of free trade. Free trade versus government regulation, the first theme we're going to look at. And also imperialism. Even though China does not become a technically a colony of European powers, it is still pressed by European powers or even bullied by European powers. So those are the two themes that I, I think we can draw out from this. How did the opium wars go down? That's the question. In the couple of decades before the Opium Wars break out, China basically controlled its trade with something called the Canton system, which basically means all foreign trade has to go through the port of Guangzhou. This seemed to work pretty well because then they can at least regulate who is coming into the country and they did not really even allow the Europeans to come into the country. They could only stay in this port. They were very, very carefully watched and regulated. So there was no free trade. The lack of free trade really bothered Great Britain because they were an industrializing nation and they had a lot of stuff to sell. So they, of course, wanted other countries to be open to trade. With China's lack of interest in all of these goods that they were trying to sell, they had to come up with something that they that China actually wanted. And they came upon this idea of selling them opium. Now, China had outlawed opium. It was illegal, but that didn't bother the British. And it actually tipped the balance of trade so that now Great Britain is getting more wealth from the trade that's happening than China. And this, of course, was uh, unacceptable to China. They weren't used to this kind of system and it, uh, in that they were used to being the winners in the trade balance. So uh, they are going to work diligently to try to solve that problem. But unfortunately, they had a lot of trouble stopping the opium trade. Starting in the 1820s, Chinese government started to take note that this was actually impairing a lot of their own people, like the soldiers and even the royal household. It was actually becoming an epidemic. Just to give some figures, in early 1800s, like 1810, you had 4,500 chests coming into China, but by 1838, you had 40,000. So it was a huge increase. And that means that there all these people who are now addicted to this opium, their lives are basically ruined. It is very difficult to get off of opium. The side, the side effects and the withdrawal effects from opium are very severe. You can actually die from withdrawal symptoms. It is an extremely painful process to withdraw. And so a lot of these people were pretty much useless for society. So it was becoming a great burden to the Chinese. So the Chinese... Uh, emperor calls a meeting and asks for opinions of his from his advisors and one of his advisors was known to be very moral and saw that saw this as a moral issue and his name was Lin Zhe Zhu I don't think I'm pronouncing that correctly Lin argued that the opium trade was evil and and that it needed to be eliminated as soon as possible and that the way you do that is by destroying the source of the drug or destroy the, the way that it is 
getting into the country. Rather than trying to punish the people who are buying the drug or regulating the people who are buying the drug, that would be just dealing with the symptom rather than the cause in his mind. So he was appointed to become the eradicator of opium in China. So he goes down to Guangzhou and he, at first he attacks the, he finds all of the Chinese who are part of the opium trade and he basically executes them. That was easy. And then he, he sends a letter to Queen Victoria and he says, why would you do, why would you allow your subjects to do something that is illegal in your own country, but allow them to do it in our country? And we have clear laws that state that this is illegal in our country also. Basically, take control of your people and make them do the right thing. That was his, his letter. It never actually got through to her because she never replied. But I, I just wonder how she would have replied to that. It would have been an interesting letter to read. He, he confiscates all the paraphernalia that goes along with smoking of opium. All the opium pipes are collected, destroyed. Then he gets the opium itself and he ends up confiscating over 20,000 chests of, of opium. This is this is more money than it would be like finding a huge batch of heroin that's been brought into the country. Like we're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of, of drugs. And he, he mixes it with salt and with just he destroys all the opium. The reason why he is able to do this is because the British superintendent at the time is called in because the, the merchants are, are furious that all of their stock is getting destroyed. And the superintendent promises them that they will be re recompensed for all the loss. And so they calmly let Lynn destroy all of their, their stores of opium with the hope and the ex expectation that they're going to get reimbursed for all this. Well, when this uh, news gets back to England, England is like, what? No, we're not going to do that. And this, of course, gets everyone mad. And they eventually talk the talk England into beginning the opium war. So they send their ships to China. They're well up to date. They've got all the latest technology. And China hasn't updated their, their Navy or their military in many, many years. So we're talking about two very mismatched militaries. Over the next two years, the British forces bombarded all of the little cities and towns along the coastlines and they even seized several cities and they attempted until they the Chinese were willing to negotiate they what did the British want well the British wanted the island of Hong Kong and they wanted the Chinese government to pay an indemnity uh, war reparations for all the damages that for basically all the opium that had been destroyed the Qing Emperor was really angry with Lin and put him in exile, which I think is really sad and unfair. Poor guy. He, he was, his career was ruined by this, this situation. But in fact, I think he was trying to do what was best for China. The British really wiped the floor with the Chinese. Their military was really antiquated. So it was a complete embarrassment to the Chinese. They had to sign this treaty. It's one of the first of what they call the unequal treaties. This is called the Treaty of Nanjing because that is where it is signed. All these treaties, by the way, and in, in world history, history are given the name of the place where they're signed usually. So this treaty gave Britain all the things that they were asking for and also the, something called extraterritoriality, which means that the British are able to live under the laws of England, even though they are living in, in China, they are not held accountable by Chinese laws. This really, it was very difficult for China because a lot of times the British would get away with a lot of stuff because they would not be prosecuted for the crimes that they had done in Chinese, on Chinese soil. So they got Hong Kong. Hong Kong at this point was just a little fishing village, but the harbor was awesome. It was deep. It was big enough for a, a fleet of ships. It was perfect for what the British envisioned should be a, a trade depot for them. They did get a huge indemnity. They also had several different ports that were now open to them. Guangzhou, Xiamen, Ningbo, and Shanghai. Um, all of these are are today large cities and part of that is because of the trade that it starts up at this time. So then Britain also wanted to have most favored nation status, which means that if China makes any agreement with another country, they must also concede that same, any of those same benefits to Great Britain as well. Basically what that means is that China will never be able to negotiate a 
a treaty that is less unequal, that is more equal, I guess we could say. So they are going to always remain in the lower status in any kind of trade agreement. And of course, this was unpalatable to China, but there was nothing they could do at this point. So 10 years go by. So 10 years go by. And in 1850, the Chinese emperor dies and his successor is wanting to get rid of this terrible uh, agreement that he has with the English. And so they actually stop fulfilling their part of the, they stop paying any money and they start closing ports and this gets England mad. And so they bring in their fleet again. And this time the French also want to piggyback on this situation. And so they bring in their fleet. They go for round two. They end up taking more towns. They go all the way to Beijing, the capital of China. And so this time they have to sign a new treaty. And this one is even more degrading. It um, They have to open more of their ports to foreign trade. And then also the interior of China is now opened up to missionaries and to traders. And so China is now losing ground in regards to its sovereignty and free trade. There's It is completely free trade and it's not benefiting China at all. Well, this brings up the situation of the Qing dynasty and its weakness. The belief system that the Chinese have about their ruling their ruling dynasties. They believe that there is something called the mandate of heaven and if bad things start to happen, it could mean that the the ruler is losing the mandate of heaven. And if someone else takes over, then that is a clear sign that the mandate of heaven has shifted to somebody else. So the Qing dynasty is feeling the weight of this philosophy. There's a lot of things going wrong for China right now. The peasants feel very strongly that there are things that are wrong. One of the things that happens during this time is the Ta- Taiping Rebellion. It is probably one of the bloodiest rebellions in, in the world up to that point, about 20 million people probably lose their lives in this rebellion. But it starts out with a peasant who probably heard some missionary talk about Christianity and he misinterpreted it and ended up believing that he was a brother of Jesus and he preaches his own version of his own religion he gets many 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 people to follow him and it ends up starting a movement to make China great again I guess you could say later on about 20 years later in 1898 there is another rebellion but this time the boxer rebellion They're trying to kill the foreigners and get rid of all the foreigners. So you have two rebellions that happen. And both of these are just symptoms of the people's belief that or the Qing dynasty has lost the mandate of heaven. And in 1912, just a few years after the Boxer Rebellion, the last emperor is going to be deposed and China is going to become a republic, going to be a very bumpy ride into the future. So that's the end.